Hello, my name is Roman Walch and I'm a PhD student at the No Center GmbH with cooperation of the Graz University of Technology and I'm mainly working on privacy preserving cryptography. And in this presentation, I will talk about our work, multi-party revocation in Sovereign, performance through distributed trust. And this is a joint work with Lukas Helminger, Daniel Carles and Sebastian Ramacher. In this presentation, I will mainly talk about cryptographic accumulators. Accumulators allow us to represent a large set very efficiently. As an example, I want to talk about the Merkle tree accumulator, which is the most commonly known and most commonly used. So the Merkle tree is basically just a tree where each node is the hash of its children. And to, for an accumulator, all the uh, elements of the set we want to accumulate are located in the leaves and the accumulator itself is then the root node. And each element of the accumulator has a corresponding witness, which basically proves that this element is part of the accumulation process. And in the Merkle tree, this witness are all elements that are required with, together with the element itself, create the accumulator, so create the root node. And this already shows a disadvantage of the Merkle tree accumulator, that the witness size is dependent on the number of elements uh, accumulated in the, in the accumulator. Alternatively, one can use public key accumulators, which are uh, based on well-known cryptographic hardness assumptions, and these accumulators have a constant witness size. However, in these accumulators, there's a secret trapdoor involved, and if you have knowledge of this trapdoor, you can create witnesses for non-members, and that is very bad. Alternatively, if you don't know the secret trapdoor, you can still use these accumulators, but then they are not really efficient. Now let's talk about accumulators in digital identity management um, systems such like Sovereign, which we have in the Dyke. Let's say we have a credential manager and he has a list of people here, Alice, Bob and Charlie, for which he has credentials. And let's say Bob wants to use these credentials to authenticate users for his service. What then happens is that the credential manager creates an accumulator and sends it to Bob. And each user receives uh, a witness of its himself being in the accumulator. So when Alice then wants to authenticate to Bob, she basically says, hey, Bob, I am Alice, I am on the list and here's my witness. And then Bob can um, look at the witness and verify it uh, against his accumulator. And if it checks out, then he can authenticate Alice. This approach is also compatible with anonymous credentials where the users do not want to disclose themselves or their witnesses to the authenticator. And how this works is the following. Um, Alice constructs a zero knowledge proof of knowledge that she knows a witness of herself being in the accumulator. And Bob can then check whether this proof works or if it is a wrong proof. And so Bob can authenticate Alice without knowing Alice and without uh, seeing her, her witness. Also, uh, what is very important for accumulators in digital identity management system is that they need to be updatable. Let's say we have uh, the credential manager wants to revoke the credentials for Charlie. Then we still need to be able to efficiently update the accumulator. And also each user needs to be able to efficiently update its witness to match the new accumulator. Otherwise, the, the user wouldn't be able to authenticate anymore. So let's talk about the QSDH accumulator. It's an accumulator with constant size witnesses. And it also is compatible with efficiency or knowledge proofs. But as I said in the beginning, without the secret trapdoor that is involved, it is not very efficient. So in this accumulator, we have the secret trapdoor S and the public key, which is basically just a generator raised to the power of S. And if you want to accumulate the set A, what we do is that we define a polynomial with all the elements of the set as the roots. And we evaluate this polynomial at the secret trapdoor S. And the accumulator then is the, this evaluated polynomial in the power um, of the generator. Uh, yeah. A witness of, um, of the element X in this accumulator is basically just the accumulator without this element X. And we can verify if this witness is correct by checking whether the exponents of the witness and the element itself match the initial accumulator. And we can do this by evaluation of a bearing equation. So if we have the knowledge of the trapdoor, we can easily compute S plus X and the inverse of S plus X very efficiently. And this implies that we can also create the witnesses of elements and also update the accumulator very efficiently. But this also implies that we can um, 
calculate this s plus x and the inverse of s plus x for x not being in the initial set. And therefore, we can create witnesses for non-members for which the uh, verification equation still works out. So in practice, if you want to use the QSDH accumulator, we have to forget this trapdoor after the public key is created. But the public key here also contains now um, um, G raised to the powers of S. And we can use these uh, new elements to evaluate this polynomial from the previous slides already in the exponent of the generator. However, since we do not have access to the secret trapdoor, we cannot calculate S plus X or S plus X uh, to the power of minus one, which basically says, if you want to create a witness for an element, or if you want to update our accumulator, we have to re-accumulate the whole set. And therefore we have a runtime for all algorithms, um, which is dependent on the size of the set we want to accumulate. And this is very bad for large sets. Therefore we had this idea that if we, uh, we can split the secrets uh, trapped among several accumulator managers, and therefore split the trust in not misusing this, um, this trapdoor. Uh, and this approach is uh, already very compatible with the, um, the, the, with the sovereign environment because in sovereign we already have these uh, multiple semi-trusted foundation managers. And as a consequence, if you split this trapdoor, no accumulator manager on its own can misuse the trapdoor to create witnesses for non-members but they can still use their shares of this trapdoor to engage in secure multi-party computation protocols to still evaluate uh, stuff like S plus X and S plus X to the power of minus one efficiently in constant time, independent of the set size. And therefore we can also create uh, um, the witnesses and also update accumulators in efficient constant time algorithms. So as a result, the initial accumulation still is dependent on the set size and all other operations on the accumulator running constant time. Furthermore, our construction is generic enough that it can be instantiated with different um, MPC protocols, for example, with speeds, um, in which an honest accumulator manager always detects malicious behavior and all accumulator managers are required to respond honestly for correctness um, of the uh, evaluations. On the other hand, we can also instantiate our protocol with um, um, our accumulator with Shamir-based MPC protocols, where only a subset of parties need to respond honestly or need to participate in the computations. And therefore, this instantiation would be um, naturally robust against parties dropping out during the computation. We implement and verify the efficiency of our MPC accumulator in the MP speeds library and we had to integrate the relic library for bank-based uh, elliptic curve cryptography there. So let's now have a look at some benchmarks. So uh, as a baseline, I want to talk about um, benchmarks of the standard QSDH accumulator without having access to the secret trapdoor. And I want to give you timings for the initial accumulation, for uh, creating a witness, also updating the accumulator after we added or deleted an element, and also um, updating the witnesses of the elements. And I give you timings for two different set sizes to the power of 10 and to the power of 14. And one can clearly see here in these benchmarks that the uh, update algorithm, so um, updating the accumulator of the elements get added or removed, and also creating witnesses have the same runtime as the initial accumulation. And also this runtime is very slow. So for two to the power of 14 elements uh, in our set, this runtime is already more than 100 seconds, which is very, very slow. For comparison, I now want to talk about benchmarks of our MPC accumulator. And um, more specifically, we instantiated this uh, accumulator for these benchmarks in the, uh, with the speeds MPC protocol. And I give you here timings for the online phase in a very fast LAN network. And I also give you the benchmarks here for two set sizes, but also um, two different numbers of accumulator managers. So in the first line, we have two accumulator managers and in the second line, we have five. And one can really observe here that except for the initial accumulation, all algorithms have a runtime independent of the set size. And also the overall runtimes are much faster than on the previous slide with the slowest one being the initial accumulation for five accumulator managers and two to the power of 14 elements. And this runtime is still less than a quarter um, second. And uh, yeah, this is much faster than the 100 seconds from the previous slide. 
For comparison, I give you diamonds for the same benchmarks in a slower network, in a slower one network. And the same behavior as in the previous slide can also be seen here that all algorithms, um, except for the initial uh, accumulation again, uh, run in a time independent of the set size. Only that the runtimes are now slower due to the slower network, but the overall runtimes, uh, the, the slowest one is uh, still um, slower than four seconds, which uh, is still less than four seconds, which is much faster than this 100 seconds again of the, the non-MPC variant. So to conclude this, uh, this talk, in this paper and this presentation, we introduced um, secret shared QSDH accumulators, which have constant uh, witness sizes. They are compatible with efficiency or knowledge proofs, and they have constant time algorithms for accumulator updates and witness creation. Our accumulator can be instantiated with different MPC protocols, for example, with the dishonest majority speeds protocol and threshold protocols based on Jamir secret sharing. We have an um, open source implementation, uh, which is on GitHub, and our implementation is in the um, commonly used MP speeds library. In the paper, we have more um, extensive benchmarks, and we also have a security proof of our construction, the UC framework, which is the standard to prove security for MPC protocols and accumulators. So this was my presentation. I want to thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Hamid. Uh, I'm going to talk about balancing privacy and accountability in blockchain identity management. This is a joint work with uh, Ivan Damgard, uh, Chaya Ganesh, Claudio Orlandi, and Luisa Siniskolch. Let's uh, start with a problem statement. So in the first generation of distributed payment system, such as Bitcoin, uh, we can say that we have a bank that is replaced with a distributed ledger and a consensus system. So these systems provide pseudonymity, but the issue with these systems is that uh, the account balance uh, is revealed actually in the transaction. And although they have pseudonymity, but it's easy to analyze the transaction graph of the users and learn some information about their identity. So to solve this problem, we have the second uh, generation uh, of uh, systems, uh, privacy preserving systems such as Zcash, that they use some zero knowledge proofs uh, for the correctness of transaction and they uh, have this advantage that they provide full anonymity for the users. But now the issue is that they are not compliant with uh, bank regulations such as uh, know your customer and anti-money laundering rules. And the fact that they don't provide any protection uh, against money laundering makes these systems very attractive for fraud activities. So the solution for this problem is to add accountability to the system, meaning that uh, in the case of a reasonable suspicion, then there are some authorized parties in the system that can uh, revoke the anonymity of the user and uh, see the transaction history and et cetera. Now, the fact that these uh, two properties of privacy and accountability are like a two contradictory requirements for the system. The question is, can we find a balance between these two properties? And this is the purpose of this work. So we design, uh, we design an identity management system for balancing between these two properties. Or design in a high level is as follows. We have three different players in the system, uh, account holder, which are just the users of the system, and two type of authorized parties, uh, identity providers and anonymity revokers. Uh, at the beginning, the users uh, wants to, that wants to create account on the blockchain, they need to register with an identity provider. So we assume that we have an account holder with an identity that we show with uh, IDAH here. Uh, the account holder has a list of attributes where at, uh, one of them is called a max ACK, which is specified the maximum number of accounts that this user can open. So this parameter can be uh, defined as an agreement between, based on an agreement uh, with the, the identity provider. 
The account holder also has a key pair and a PRF key K. And with this information, the account holder runs a interactive blind signature protocol with the identity provider. So they run this protocol with together and at the end of the protocol, the account holder receive a signature from the identity provider on his attribute list uh, and the secret, his secret key and the PRF key key. And it is important that the, the identity provider doesn't learn about the secret key and the PRF key of the account holder. So it's a, the signature is done in a blind way. And at the end, the, uh, the, the account holder received this signature and the identity provider also re received uh, some, uh, some information that stores at the end, which are the identity of the account holder, uh, the attribute list, and the, the public key of the account holder and the encryption of the PRF key under the public key of the anonymity revoker. Now that the account holder uh, has this uh, certificate, has this uh, signature from the identity provider, he can create uh, several different accounts. And the account creation is as follows. So we assume that the account holder uh, can create uh, uh, different accounts for different policies that he want to use. Uh, so the cre account creation is by start with uh, generating a key pair for the account and then computing the encryption of the, the public key, the account holder public key under the public key of the anonymity revoker, uh, then computing the PRF of X uh, at the time that this account holder is creating the X account. Uh, so we call this the account ID and then generating an easy proof for proving the knowledge of the certificate from the identity provider and the knowledge of the secret key of the account. This NISIC proof also uh, shows the correctness of the computation and the fact that the attribute list satisfy the policy and uh, the fact that this X is less than max X parameter. So the account holder is not creating more than uh, uh, accounts that is allowed to open. And then the account holder publish uh, this uh, information, which is called account creation information on the blockchain, consisting of the account ID, uh, EID, the public key of the account, uh, the public policy and the NISIC proof. And now everyone can publicly verify the correctness, the validity of this account by checking the, uh, the NISIC proof. Now, if at some point uh, there are some uh, suspicious account, we need to revoke the anonymity of the user in this case. A suspicious account can be, for example, an account that uh, it, its uh, account ID is duplicated in the system. So if the account holder is not, because the account holder is not allowed to open more than a max act number of account, one way to cheat is to create two different accounts with the same ID. So in this case, the anonymity revoker and the ID provider uh, uh, with help of each other, they can decrypt and revoke the anonymity of the user. So the anonymity revoker decrypt the EID inside the account creation information and send the public key of the account holder to the identity provider. And now that the identity provider knows the, the identity of the account holder corresponding to this public key, he can just reveal this uh, identity to everyone, to some, to anyone, uh, the, for example, to the authorized parties. And now that we know one party, one, uh, we know the identity of the account holder, we want to also be able to trace different accounts that this party is creating in the, the chain. So the idea is that in this case, the identity provider send the encryption of the PRF key K to the anonymity revoker, because we are assuming that the identity provider is storing this cipher text in the, inside the tuple he's receiving from the, after the blind signature protocol. He sent the cipher text to the anonymity revoker and the anonymity revoker decrypt and both, they both together can find the, the PRF key K, K 
And now they can find a compute PRF of K on, of X for X from one up to max X, which are all possible account IDs that this account holder might have. So we implement or uh, design with uh, a lot of cryptographic tools and techniques, uh, including a Pedersen commitment. And the, for the PRF, uh, uh, we use, for the PRF construction, we use uh, PRF by Dodis and Jan Polsky. For the blind signature, we use a signature type of signature from Poincheol Saunders. Uh, and we, for the anonymity revoker, we actually implement, we assume a threshold assumption on the anonymity revoker. So there exist n different anonymity revokers and we use a threshold encryption uh, for these anonymity revokers, which is implemented by uh, Shamir secret sharing. And, uh, and in the case that we want to encrypt a group element, we use uh, El Gamal encryption. And in the case of encrypting a field element, for example, the PRF encrypting the PRF key, we use a, another encryption scheme called the CL encryption. For the NISIC proof also, we use a Fiat Shamir NISIC based on Sigma protocols in combination with the ZK SNARKs on committed inputs. For the security analysis, uh, as I said before, we make a threshold assumption on the anonymity revokers such that even a, a malicious ident provider with cooperating with the malicious anonymity revoker, they cannot uh, re, uh, connect a, an account to an account holder. And also for the security, we prove the security in the UC model against a actively corrupt account holder, passively corrupt identity providers and a threshold number of passively corrupt anonymity revokers. Uh, thanks for your attention. And the full version of the paper is on ePrint. So if you are interested, you can check it out. Hi, I'm Yash. I'm a PhD candidate at Northeastern University. And I'll be telling you about my work on non-interactive half aggregation of DSA and Schnorr signatures. Uh, this is joint work with Costas, Francois, and Leda at Novi. So in this work, we study how to non-interactively aggregate Schnorr or DSA signatures using methods that don't depend on the exact code of the hash function all of the group. And we design and implement both of our constructions, uh, which achieve various trade-offs in terms of efficiency and security. And we show that such techniques are essentially optimal in that we can't go beyond 50% compression. Right, so a quick recap of uh, the characteristics of Schnorr signatures as follows. So what's good about them is that they achieve security under conservative well-studied assumptions, specifically that of the discrete log problem being hard in its group. And individual signatures are quite compact and fast to generate and verify, assuming we instantiate with an elliptic curve group, for instance. Additionally, the linear structure allows efficient interactive aggregation. That is, it's quite easy to construct threshold signing and multi-signature protocols for Schnorr. But on the downside, um, we don't have any native interactive aggregation, sorry, native non-interactive aggregation procedures for Schnorr, unlike say BLS. What do I mean when I say uh, non-interactive aggregation? So let's say Alice has a bunch of signatures under some public keys for some messages. So once she's collected these signatures, she wants to transmit them to Bob. The simple and naive way to do this would be to simply have Alice send um, all of these signatures to Bob in the clear, and this achieves this goal. But we can do something more sophisticated in certain cases. That is, we can have Alice feed all of her signatures into some sort of aggregation machinery, which then outputs an aggregate signature, which combines the effect of all of these individual signatures. Alice can then send this aggregated signature to Bob in place of the individual signatures. And the advantage of doing such a thing is that presumably this aggregate signature is lighter than these individual signatures in some sense. In our case, it's going to mean that it, this aggregate signature consumes less bandwidth than the individual signatures. As a simple application of such a technique, we can compress blockchain blocks. That is, if we consider each block in a blockchain to be comprised of a number of individual signatures, applying that aggregation machinery, we can shrink these uh, blocks to smaller sizes and save on bandwidth. So the scope of our problem is defined as follows. 
we look at the task of constructing a proof of knowledge for the language of Schnorr signatures. That is, an aggregate signature serves as a non-interactive proof that the, that the aggregator has seen Schnorr signatures that correspond to those uh, public keys and messages known to the world. The idea is to use this as a drop in the placement in any larger protocol that requires uh, bunches of Schnorr signatures to be sent around. And the idea is to get um, nice composition guarantees from this. That is, replacing an object in a larger protocol with the proof of knowledge of that object, make sure that you don't have to spend a lot of effort reproving security of the larger protocol. The thing is, we already know how to build such compressing proofs of knowledge. Take your favorite SNARK, for example. While this establishes feasibility, using a generic SNARK for such a task is prohibitively expensive for most applications. In particular, the um, using a genetic technique would require re representing the hash function of Schnorr as a circuit and then feeding it into the SNARK. And for standard hash functions, such as SHA-2 that's used by EDDSA, this induces a really large circuit and makes it quite expensive for most applications. So we introduce an additional constraint that whatever technique we design must be black box in the hash function. That is, use the hash function and group operations as oracles. So our techniques are as follows. A quick recap of what a sigma protocol is for a relation. A prover has a witness W that proves membership in some language of some public statement X. So public instance X. Um, the prover begins by sending the first message A to which it is challenged by the verifier with E. And finally, the prover responds with Z. And the idea is that a sigma protocol has N special soundness. That is given N accepting conversations such that they all share the same first message A. There is, a, there is an efficient method to extract a witness W for the statement. So within this framework, we construct a sigma protocol for, the, for proving knowledge of a Schnorr signature. So recall that a Schnorr signature consists of these components, a public key, a nonce capital R, um, E that is the challenge that's derived by hashing the public key, the nonce and the message being signed, and S, which is a linear combination of the, public, of the secret key and the nonce. A Schnorr signature is verified as follows. First, we compute capital S as the same linear combination um, in the exponent that E times the public key plus R. And then we check that this lowercase s value is indeed the discrete log of uh, the capital S that we just computed. So observe that if we omit this lowercase s value, we're still able to execute the first step of verification. That is, we can still compute this capital S. That's a combination of the public key and the nonce. And I claim now that instead, in place of uh, revealing this S value, this lowercase L S value directly to the verifier, it is just as good if we give a proof of knowledge of discrete log of capital S. And capital S is specified by just the public key and the nonce and the message. The second tool that we use for compression is uh, the standard tool of compressing proofs of knowledge for multiple discrete log instances. And this proceeds as follows. For um, a number of public, let's say elliptic curve points, capital X1 to capital Xn, Alice possesses their discrete logs, lowercase x, x1 to lowercase xn. Bob, who is the verifier, challenges Alice to reveal some linear combination of these uh, discrete logs. That is, he sends over a value E and ZQ. And Alice computes a linear combination of these xi values, where the coefficient of the ith term in the linear combination is just e raised to the power i minus 1. Alice then sends this linear combination z, which Bob can check in the exponent for correctness. So what this achieves is n special soundness. Specifically, given n accepting conversations, we now have n linearly independent combinations of these xi values. So that's n equations and n unknowns, and we can simply solve for each xi. So now we can combine these two tools to get a compressed sigma protocol to prove knowledge of n Schnorr signatures. This proceeds as follows. Given that the messages and public keys are known to both the prover and the verifier, the prover Alice additionally has 
signatures ri and si for each i and n and the prover then sends over these nonces these ris to the verifier bob the verifier then for each i and n executes the first step of the verification process that is computing this capital si as a linear combination of the public key and the nonce where um, the combination is weighted by hashing the public key the nonce and the message the verifier then sends a challenge e in zq which the prover uses the same way as earlier to uh, compute a linear combination of its si values where the ith coefficient is e to the i minus 1 uh, call this z once z is sent over to the verifier uh, he can then check that this relation does indeed hold in the exponent so what this accomplishes is that whereas naive transmission requires sending each ri and si for i and n the compressed sigma protocol requires you to send only the ri values and also a single z in place of all the s values and given that r and s are roughly the same size this is essentially 50% compression so now what we have is a sigma protocol which is interactive but what we want is a non interactive proof there are standard compilers to go from a sigma protocol to a non interactive proof of knowledge such as that of fiat shamir which achieves optimal efficiency at the cost of a loose security proof or that of fishlin which gives us a tight security proof but a reduced efficiency we implement and benchmark both constructions using the dalek library for adsa and our takeaway is that the fiat shamir construction is already very practical in that you can aggregate over 1000 signatures in less than a millisecond and verifying these ag verifying an aggregate signature comes at no penalty because it comes because it costs the same as verifying the 1000 signatures by themselves in the clear fishlin's transformation on the other hand gives a much more expensive object to compute and verify but it does give tight security and achieves um, close to 50% compression as the number of signatures increases increases it's natural to ask if we can do any better that is uh, if we can achieve any better than 50% compression unfortunately we show that this compression rate is essentially optimal for any aggregation scheme that makes oracle use of the hash function in schnorr what this means is that going beyond this 50% compression uh, compression rate must inherently depend on the code of the hash function and unfortunately all methods that we know that make non black box use of the code of the hash function uh, are quite expensive for instance feeding the expressing the hash function as a circuit and then feeding the circuit into a snark for proving and this can get quite expensive in practice for instance for adsa proving knowledge of n signatures would imply proving knowledge of n sha2 pre images so i encourage you to see the paper for more discussions on how to use these constructions optimizations and generally more discussions so how to apply these constructions in your own protocols is first see if your higher level protocol involves sending around large batches of signatures and ask if the exact bit representations of these batches are really that important and if not then you can apply our aggregation construction to maybe save up to 50% in bandwidth when these signatures are transmitted so thank you for your attention and please do check out our work online and the code is available publicly on github as well Thanks.